Let's look at uh, parathyroid hormone levels in these patients. The parathyroid hormone normogram, again, it's a Gaussian distribution with an obvious skew to the left. Uh, the average parathyroid hormone level in our 10,000 patients in this database is 105. The mean is 95, the mode is 84. In other words, what, pa what number do we see the most often? 84. So we're not operating people with parathyroid hormone levels. If you're sending us a patient with a, with a parathyroid hormone level of 240, I can carry the, guarantee that patient's had a parathyroid tumor for a decade or more, all right? This is not your goal. Your goal is to avoid this, all right? Much more, we can tell much more about the age and duration of the disease by the degree of elevation of the parathyroid hormone than we can the calcium. And that all, I think, will become clear as we develop more and more of these graphs. All right, this is the highest. Just like before, you guys don't always look at the average. You don't average out their parathyroid hormone levels. You look at their highest sometimes. And here, again, the highest, the highest PTH level that we see in, as an average of the 10,000 is 115, mean, mean 104, and still a mode, still way down here in the 70s. All right, so uh, the most frequent, highest PTH level that we ever see is 70. Again, you don't need these levels way over here, and we'll talk about this stuff here in a few minutes. Age distribution, just like calcium's got a little bit of a difference, and with, with teenagers, we see a bell shape or a, a bimodal uh, curve here with age. So our younger folks and our older folks tend to have higher, not ten, they do as, as a group have statistically higher PTH levels. And, and we can get into that, why that is. Uh, that This is a whole lecture, right, in this one slide here. Suffice to say, we tend to see older folks with higher levels and younger folks with higher levels. But all of us in this room, we, we tend to see patients with our parathyroid hormone levels, your typical parathyroid, your 59-year-old female, average. Okay, it's your average parathyroid patient, a 59-year-old female. She's right in here. She's got a PTH of 100 on average. Normal, non-suppressed PTH. This gives a lot of people, not the people in this room, because you're all smarter than average, but it gives a lot of endocrinologists, a lot of you know, internal medicine folks some trouble because they're trying to see, trying to make the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism with a patient who's got both high calcium and high parathyroid hormone at the same time. We hear, this, we hear this every day. You don't need a high PTH to make a diagnosis of parathyroid disease. In fact, what you need is an inappropriate PTH. And some of that's gonna be more clear as we talk more and more through this, these next slides. But suffice it to say that there are hundreds, in fact, over a thousand of our patients here have never had a high PTH. They have the same parathyroid tumor as these people do. They are no different, okay? So 16% have an average parathyroid hormone level of 65 or less, a normal PTH, intact PTH assay. 10 and a half, so over 1,000 in this database of 10,000 have never had a PTH over 65. They still have a parathyroid tumor because they have inappropriate, their calcium's 11.2, their PTH is 52, their PTH is 45. That's a parathyroid tumor. We see that people struggle with that all the time. And some, some more of these graphs will help uh, explain that as well. So you don't need, you guys know this, you don't need a high PTH to have the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. So let's look at the relationship between parathyroid hormone level and calcium, okay? If I was to ask all of you, if the PTH goes up, does the calcium go up? You all say yes. Well, it's not exactly true, okay? There is a positive slope to the line, okay? There is a positive slope, but as a general rule, so there is a positive correlation, but it's not very, po it's not very tight. It's very, very loose. You can have a calcium of 10.2 and a parathyroid hormone level of 300, or frequently 150, or you can have a calcium of 12 and a PTH of 55, all right? We see this, we see people struggle with this all the time. They've got a, a patient sent to you, their calcium is 11.8, 12.1, 
They measure it again, it's 10, 9, it's 11, it's all variable, they're all high, but their PTH is only 50, 60. You know, a lot, of, a lot of endocrinologists will struggle with that, saying, well, it doesn't make sense. If their calcium's 12, their parathyroid hormone levels will be 300, maybe there's something else going on. You can't do that, you can't predict. Don't try to predict, it's a scattergram, okay? So it happens all the time. If the parathyroid hormone level is anything but less than 25, is basically our cutoff when we're evaluating people. You send us a patient with high calcium and their PTH is less than 25, we get a little leery. If their parathyroid hormone level is in the 30, that's it. Because, and I'll show you later why that is, but you know, we've learned this over, over thousands and thousands of patients. So it's extremely variable, it's a scattergram. It's not necessarily true that if, if your patient's got a calcium of 11 and a half, they have to have a parathyroid hormone level of 250. It's not necessarily true. And vice versa, if their calcium is 10 and a half, they can have a parathyroid hormone level of 200. All right, so don't try to predict that you'll get in trouble. You won't get in trouble, you just make more work for yourself. So um, let's look at 24 hour urine. This is the last uh, segment of this talk where we've looked at calcium levels in these 10,000 patients, parathyroid hormone levels in these 10,000 patients. Now let's look at some 24 hour urine calcium patients in this, in this thing. You know, a lot of you are gonna, some of the hair in the back of your neck's gonna stand up and you guys are gonna, because we're gonna shoot some holes in some long standing caveats that you guys have been taught and your mentors were taught and they were taught back in 1925. But uh, some of the things you've been taught may not be true, so let's take a look at some of these things. 24-hour urine normogram, just like calcium and just like PTH, it's a bell-shaped curve. It does have a skew, but it's a bell-shaped cur curve of a, of a normal population. All right, these are all patients who have a primary hyperparathyroid, not secondary, not renal failure, okay? These are people with primary hyperparathyroidism and they have a parathyroid tumor that we took out, okay? Here is the number of patients, okay, in the hundreds, and here's the 24 hour year calcium levels. There's lots of patients, hundreds of patients that we've operated on who have 24 hour year calcium levels less than 100, all right? Now, you all thinking, wait a minute. The reason I get a 24 hour urine is because I'm trying to rule out FHH from primary hyperparathyroidism because then maybe their calcium's high because it's FHH. So I gotta get a 24 hour urine test because the calcium's low in the urine, that means I get FHH and not. All right, let's look at it in different data. All right, let's look differently, okay? Here's uh, uh, about 8,500 because not in this database of 10,000, not every patient got a 24 hour urine test. And I'm gonna look at that. In my subsequent talk, I'm going to look at the, that because some of you don't get 24-hour urine tests and some of you do. But, and we know who you are, by the way. <laughs> so, it's a scattergram, okay? And it's a, it's a scattergram of a population. And that population doesn't just somehow stop right here at some arbitrary number of 100. There are patients with very low very low 24-hour urine calciums that we operate on and have parathyroid tumors, all right? So as you're gonna see in this talk and in subsequently Doug's and then I'm gonna hammer it home again, you can't determine FHH from primary hyperparathyroidism by a 24-hour urine test. You heard it here first. And some of you guys already know that because we see your notes and you figured it out yourself by practicing this, and we, we can read your notes and we see how you interpret it. So some of you already know this. You figured it out yourself, but you can't determine who has it. Now another thing, look at, there's blue squares and red squares here, okay? Blue squares, no stones, red stone, red squares, people who have stones. Let's look at that a little bit closer. This is relationship between kidney stones and urinary calcium levels, okay? The concept, of course, the NIH criteria, people who have high urinary calcium, they're more suspect to get renal failure or, or kidney stones, not true. Look at here, this data. So with stones, the dark bar, without stones, the lighter bar, okay? And you see, again, a bell-shaped curve. They follow the same bell-shaped curve, only difference is 
So people without stones, the curve is skewed to the left, is, is displaced to the left a little bit, while the people with stones are skewed to the right or displaced to the right a little bit. So they're, they're the same exact graph, one graph moved over a little bit. You still have people with really high calcium levels who don't get stones. And you have people who have very low 24-hour urine calcium levels who do get stones, all right? So the, 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 the value, just another one of those values you put in your back pocket here, that the value of a 24-hour urine test is not very valuable. It's not going to predict who has or doesn't have periodontal disease, and it's also not going to predict who will or not get kidney stones. So 24-hour urine calcium and primary hyperparathyroidism. The 24-hour urine calcium is not of help making a diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. Some of you know that. So when you call us on the phone and you tell us that I've got this patient with this and this and this, and, and then a 24-hour urine calcium is this, just know that on the other end of the phone, my eyes are glazing over and rolling back to the back of my head because we have learned how treating thousands of these patients that we pay very little. Now, there are times when this can be helpful in these little confusion areas. And we go on our website, the advanced diagnosis page, we talk about that extensively. There are a couple instances where a 24-hour urine test can be helpful. But as a general rule, we don't use it, and neither should you. Low urinary calcium does not rule out pri uh, primary hyperparathyroidism. You cannot distinguish FHH from primary hyperparathyroidism based upon 24-hour urine tests, regardless of what you were taught in your residency, regardless of what it says on your, uh, on your boards. There is no relationship between urine calcium levels and serum calcium levels. You cannot predict. It is a scattergram. And kidney stones, are, kidney stones are roughly seeing the same frequency at all levels of 24-hour urine calcium levels. A little bit different, but as a general rule, you can't predict. All right, this is, this is the last slide. What we did was we've established a few things. We've established um, parathyroid hormone levels. We've established this blue curve, what parathyroid hormone levels are in patients with primary parathyroidism, what calcium levels are in primary parathyroidism. We, we've shown you with a bell-shaped curve where most of these patients live. Most of these patients are in the high tens. Most of the patients with parathyroid disease have calcium levels in the high tens, low 11s. They don't, they're not up here, okay? Um, and so, uh, and their parathyroid hormone levels are mostly around 80, 90, 100. That's the most common. There are lots of people with parathyroid disease with, parathyroid, with calcium levels in the 30s and 40s. And it's not part of what we're talking about. Okay, thanks very much for this talk.